the Roman centurion, who understood authority and whose faith, faith so impressed the Lord, when he said to him, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. And it was another Roman centurion, St. Cornelius, who was the first Gentile convert mentioned in the Bible and who was baptized by St. Peter himself at Caesarea. Are you aware that one of the four colossal statues in the rotunda of St. Peter's Basilica depicts another Roman soldier from Scripture? traditionally known as Longinus, the man who pierced the wounded heart of our Lord upon the cross. And besides the scripture, there are other examples from the shining halls of heaven's saints. There is the supernatural commander, St. Michael, the glorious St. George, the heroic St. Sebastian, the selfless St. Alban, the zealous St. Ignatius, the fearless St. Francis, the startling St. Joan of Arc, the dutiful crusader king St. Louis. And this is by no means a complete list. Some of these saints were martyrs for the faith, others veterans who lived, whose lives on earth went on to bless us with years beyond their service in the military. The early church was in no way anti-military. More frequently, the church fathers, even in the years of imperial state persecution of the church, would nevertheless look to the discipline of the Roman military as an example of virtue to emulate. Just consider the legendary example of St. Maurice and the Theban Legion. There was a chapel dedicated to St. Maurice in Charlemagne's imperial church in Aachen, and the Holy Roman Emperors received the sword and spurs of St. Maurice at their crowning for centuries. One of the most popular saints in Western Europe, St. Maurice was an African, an African commander of a legion of over 600 African men who went to their own death through serial decimation because they refused to carry out an unjust order to massacre a Christian town in the Alps. Christian imperial dynasties ever since have included among the names of their princes the name Maurice. And in France alone, there are some 70 towns named for the martyr. Still, on Veterans Day, called Armistice Day in other countries of the world. This falls on the feast of St. Martin of Tours, a day chosen so that at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, hostilities would end forever on the feast of this heroic military saint. At last, World War I ended, one of the deadliest conflicts in human history, a war that left over 30 five million casualties, including 10 million military casualties, 21 million wounded, and almost 8 million missing. Our current age of historical amnesia cannot always make the connections, but until only recently, St. Martin, who died in the year 397, was universally recognized in Western Christianity as one of its greatest saints, a soldier turned monk and then bishop, a real father of Western civilization, a man fearless of death and courageous in his self-giving life. The great priest, St. Martin, is almost never shown as a bishop, and more frequently in artwork, he's shown as a soldier before his conversion cutting his cloak in half, giving it to a naked beggar who represents Christ our Lord. The church is not really pacifist in its nature. We see ourselves as a church militant, which is not to say that we force others to convert or die, 
but rather that we know that the Christian life is one of struggle against forces that want our ruin. This is why the notion of being a soldier and being a monk is not ironic at all, because the Christian must be prepared for spiritual battle, and we must be pre prepared for persecution, so that under the test we will, like St. Maurice, not deny Christ. Some, numbers, some number of months ago, I had a rare opportunity to be more or less alone with two other priests in a section of the Vatican that is rare to see. We were about to come celebrate with some bishops and cardinals, so they exiled us lowly priest to vest somewhere outside of the main sacristy where all of the great bishops were. And so we found ourselves in these magnificent rooms that are used primarily by the Pope at his election. One of these rooms is the Hall of Benediction that leads to the balcony overlook, overlooking St. Peter's Square, where a new Pope is introduced to the world. You can imagine what a ridiculously large room that was for three priests to be vesting in. But another of these great rooms was the Sala Regia, or the Regal, or Royal Hall, which is just next to the Sistine Chapel, and almost as impressive, completed in 1573, and every square inch is painted. It has been described as the most beautiful and the richest hall that it has ever been in the world. <clears throat> None of these rooms are open to the public or, or are on the Vatican Museum tour. And so these are very close to the papal apartments in the Vatican. Anyway, this pastor from an Appalachian parish tried not to look too much like a tourist. The Sala Regia was where royalty and diplomats meet the Pope. But on this day, these series of great rooms were empty, save for we three priests and an occasional Swiss guard who passed through the room. It was funny, really. There we were in these grand rooms, rarely used, with our little water bottles and our black attache, attache cases as we invested in our little travel albums in the Vatican. But around us were these incredible frescoes that I myself had only studied in picture books. Massive paintings covering massive walls, each one telling some part of history, each one hundreds of years old, masterpieces all. The one that impressed me the most was this enormous fresco of the Battle of Lepanto. I just read a book on the Battle of Lepanto, so I was excited to see it. I could see all the formations, and they had painted all of how the, how the ships lined up. Anyway, I tried to imagine what it might be like if someone was chosen to be Pope in the Sistine Chapel and then ushered into the Pauline Chapel to cry, <laughs> to really cry, and then to be fitted with a white cassock that didn't really fit, and then to be sort of ushered onto this balcony overlooking St. Peter's Square, no doubt crying, terrified. And you walk through these vast halls and you look up to see these frescoes that remind the Pope daily that Christendom has so many times been nearly lost and that enemies are always pressing in. In 1571, it was the sailors of the Holy League who pushed back the advancing Ottoman Turks, just like it was Charles Martel who pushed back the advance of militant Islam in 733. It was Constantine who took the Milvian Bridge in Rome in 314. These great military events painted on the walls of the papal apartments remind the popes throughout the ages that even our peaceful and tolerant religion has been preserved at times by those who were not only capable of dying for the faith, but who were also willing to fight for its survival. 
I imagine the prayers of the popes before these paintings, surrounded as they are. Imagine the prayer of Pope Benedict XV 100 years ago, who decried World War I as a useless slaughter and who endeavored to find its end. Armistice Day came, November the 11th. It was imperfect, the peace process and their drafted treaties, a process that the Holy Father had been excluded from, led almost directly to World War II and another 73 million dead. While the horrific wars of the 20th century had nothing to do with religion, and while the church is not entirely pacifist, the church clearly works for peace and can so often see both sides, because so often on both sides, Catholics fight. Perhaps this is the reason that all hostilities ceased on Martinmas, for whom some of the oldest churches in Britain and Italy and France and Germany are named. He lived in an empire before our modern states were born, and before the rise of national, nationalism fueled our modern wars, and before the Vatican would ever have needed a sala regia to impress the princes of Europe. He lived in a time when Christians were united more than they are today, with no sectarian division. He himself was a soldier, a virtuous man, a patron saint of soldiers, who laid down his armor, and who became a missionary. On November the 11th, 1918, there was peace among the kingdoms of man, and war stopped for a moment on the feast of St. Martin of Tours. And so, did, so today we pause and thank God for the men and the women who are serving and who have served in our armed forces, who have placed their lives in harm's way and who are placing their lives in harm's way today. We pray for peace in our troubled world that seems to seek to nearly teeter on the precipice today, that through the intercession of St. Martin, we may all be able to lay down our armor and take up the peaceful mantle of Christ's kingdom as brothers and sisters, and begin again 